Greetings, Bannister Row Baptist Church. Greetings, Bannister Row. This is our fourth lesson on re how to resolve conflict. So this is our fourth lesson on how to resolve conflict. So I, I brought some ink pens. The ink pens are on the back table because you're going to have to do a little writing because of copyright and me using Mr. Sandy's material. I can't necessarily put it all on the on the uh, outline sheet for you. So but you can write it. I can teach it and you can write it, but I can't just put it on the paper. Does that make sense for copyright purposes? So let's go to James chapter four and verse one first. James chapter four and verse one. James four and verse one, the Bible says from which comes Wars and fighting among you. Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members. There were battles and conflict going on with the saints in James' day, and James addresses it and he's trying to let them know this is what is causing the conflict. And he breaks that down when you look at verses 2. And three, but I wanted you to understand. I read that scripture so that you'll understand that conflict is normal. It's not abnormal. It's normal. If you're living in this world, you will experience some kind of conflict at one time or another. And what the goal is of going through this series is to give us some tools on how we should handle conflict. Does that make sense? So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you and we thank you. For this day, we ask that you will continue to speak to us through your word. Lord Jesus, we submit to you. And I ask, Father God, that you will help me to, to glorify Christ and glorify you at the same time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. People, people have this concept that they want people to think certain things about them. And that's just the worldly thought process. And I know you're going to understand what I mean by this, because I had adapted this thought process at one time. I don't take no junk. Don't mess with me. And I'm tough. But let's be honest, is that thought process Christ like? Because I'm going to be honest with you, I'm one of them people. I'm going to keep it real with you. I don't take no junk. I don't. And I'm telling you right now, don't mess with me. <laughs> you hear me? Don't mess with me. And, and, and if we're going to talk about being tough, I'm about as tough as they come. Whatever you got, I can handle it. But what I've learned about people is they come with that mindset, but then when you put it to the test, they, they, they get offended. So what I'm saying is that now that I'm trying to be more like Christ, I have to be careful with that. Don't mess with me mindset. You understand? I, I allow people to mess with me. Does that make sense? And people mess with me today and they think I'm soft. And I just sit back and say, Lord, you done done a work in my life. Lord, you done done a work in my life. For us to be like Christ, I want to challenge you today to practice these seven A's of confession. Seven A's of confession. And before we look at the seven A's of confession, I want you to look at Proverbs 28 and verse 13. Proverbs 28 and verse 13. Proverbs 28, verse 13. This is this is one of my favorite scriptures because this is one of the first time that God spoke to me directly. When I had messed up and God spoke to me through this scripture, Proverbs 28, verse 13, he said, he that covers his sins shall what? Not prosper, but whoso confesses and forsaketh them shall what? You, 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 you got to understand what he's saying there. When you try to cover your sins. You're not going to prosper. But if you confess your sin and forsake your sins, you will find mercy. And that's what God wants from us. God wants us to confess our sins 
And then after we confess our sins, he wants us to put in every effort we can put in to not do it anymore. And when we have that mindset, guess what we get? Mercy. OK, so we're talking about confession. I'm going to give you seven A's from Ken Sandy's book, uh, Peacemaker. Seven A's of confession. Number one, A, address everyone involved. Address everyone involved. So what does that look like? Private matters should be kept what? Private. Public matters need to be dealt with what? Publicly. Sometimes a situation may require that we get the whole church involved. There's times when the whole church may have to get involved in solving conflict. Go to Matthew 18 and verse 17. And I know we don't typically do this, but this is why I'm going through this lesson, because I need you to understand from a scripture standpoint how we should be handling things. Matthew 18 and verse 17. If if. If you go to a brother, verse 15, if a brother, if you, it says if a brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him the father. If somebody do something wrong to you, guess what you should do? What should you do? According to verse 15, go to them, right? Not go to somebody else. Who should you go to? Them and talk to them and tell them their fault. And if they hear you, then you guess what? Your relationship is strengthened. Now, verse 16 said, if they don't want to listen to you, what do you do in verse 16? You take you some witnesses and y'all go try to fix the situation again. Right. If that don't work, what does it say do in verse 17? That's how we do that. And that's how we keep peace within the body of Christ. But, you know, and I'm just going to touch on this for a second. And I'm guilty of it, too, at times. You know what we do when we have problems? Instead of us going to the person that we got a problem with, who we talk to? You see how that works? But if we learn how to resolve conflict correctly, we don't have to be scared of conflict. Does that make sense? This is most important, though, when dealing with everyone involved. Watch this. I mean, listen to this. Don't don't miss this. When we talk about dealing with everyone involved, start with yourself first. That's right. That's right. I mean, that that's that's so important. When we talk about dealing with everyone involved, start with yourself first. Look at Proverbs 41 and verse four. Not Proverbs, Psalms. Psalms 41 and verse 4. The psalmist said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul. For what? For I have sinned against thee. You see the concept? The psalmist was focused on who? Himself, He said, I have sinned against thee. We should be able to discern between good and evil. So it's always easy to see where other people need Christ. It's so hard for us to see where we need what? We need Christ. Number two, A, avoid if but and maybe when we talk about starting with yourself, avoid using the word if, but or maybe avoid using those words if, but or maybe. And what I mean by that is this. You ever had somebody come up to you and say, if I offended you, I'm sorry. Now, don't misunderstand me. There may be times that we do need to use the word if because Say, say you come to church, you come to church, 
you come to church week after week after week and your brother or sister in Christ that used to talk to you now is not talking to you. It's OK to go up to them and say, hey, if I offended you, I want to apologize because if I've done something to you, the reason you're not speaking to me, I, I want to make things right. But if you know you done did something wrong to somebody, you know you done said something wrong, you know you done did something wrong, that's not the time to say when y'all in y'all discussion and you just say, well, if I offended you, I'm sorry. You really not what? You keep that apology. Or, or, or saying, hey, I apologize, but... You see, you see how you you might well what? Might keep that apology. I mean, because you're not really apologizing. You apologizing, but but you want to bring up. So we should avoid using if as much as possible. What that means is that we need to be honest. Okay, number three. Speaking of being honest, admit specifics. Admit specifics. Let's be honest. We know when we're using sinful words or hurtful words, right? You know. Look at Proverbs 12 and verse 18. Proverbs 12 and look at verse 18. The Bible says there is that speaketh like the piercing of a sword, but the tongue of the wise is help. We know how powerful words are. Words can penetrate our heart for the good or the bad. Man, somebody could say something to you 20 years ago and guess what? You still what? Huh? You remember? Right or wrong? I don't have people say stuff to me and I have I have forgiven them. I have forgiven them, but I ain't forgot. You understand? I have forgiven them, but I ain't forget. And I tell God sometimes, Lord, what in the world? Why do I remember that? Some, so sometimes I don't forget this individual, but I still what? Remember what they said. Don't play because words are powerful. So then if we know the power of words, then how much more should we be cautious of the words that we use when we're speaking to people? Wise people use their words for spiritual purposes. Fleshly people use their words for protection. Do you know if we're not careful, see in the world they use words to protect themselves. But in the church, we should be using our word to build one another up for the furtherance of the gospel. It's hard to have that mindset. But as I keep saying through these lessons, sometimes we got to be willing to lose so that God can what? Number four, a acknowledge the hurt. Acknowledge the hurt. Express sincere sorrow. For the way you affected the other person. Acknowledge the hurt. If somebody, this is this one thing I had to learn in marriage and dealing with my kids, and I'm transferring that over into all my relationships. If somebody say I did something to them, I can't downplay that. If somebody say, man, you hurt my feelings by what you said. I can't say, man, get over it. I can't say. Well, man, you shouldn't let that little thing that I did bother you so much. No, if that's how they feel, I have to really feel their pain. That's what it's, that's where empathy comes from. Empathizing with people. Just because you are hardcore and know nothing bothers you. You can't expect everybody else to be like that. And I will be honest with you. Sometimes I sit and look at some of the things people get offended of. And I'm like, are you serious? Are you gonna let that bother you? That, that's what I'm saying, Jeff. That's what I'm saying. People can give it, but they they act like they're ready to take it. But when you give it to them, give it to them, they ain't ready. And that's what I mean about 
the tongue because where I'm from, we learned how to go deep. We go where we we ain't believing what Michelle Obama talking about. You go low, we go high. No, you go low, we go lower. <laughs> and then we see we see how low we can go until somebody. You know how we used to do it back in the day. As soon as you say that that your mama stuff, your your mama. We don't went. You don't went too far now. But you want to get in the kitchen and start cracking jokes? No, your mama, your daddy, your cousins, your kids, all y'all. <laughs> Let me stick with the notes. Stick with the notes. That's why I said acknowledge the hurt. Because just because you're not feeling that pain, if you hurt somebody, you got to have empathy and, and understand that, that you, you hurt them. Words hurt. And let me say this for those of y'all that have kids. Go back and tell your kids genuinely you apologize and be sincere about it. Because I'm going to tell you, I almost fell into that trap that I'm the daddy and what I say go. And I started off like that, but I'm not rolling like that no more. And the reason I'm not rolling like that is because my kids have feelings. I'm not just going to tell them I'm the daddy. It's my house. You do what I tell you to do. No. No, even though that's true, Reg, it's true. I'm not I'm not rolling like that. Because that's only going to go so far until they get old enough to think for themselves. And then they're watching your mannerism. If you did something to your child when they were young, apologize. Because that could be hindering them from coming to church. That could be hindering them from being all that they could be in Christ because they looking at you like, man, look how you talk to me. Look how you treat me. Look how you talk to auntie. Look how you talk to uncle. And you then you want to talk to me about Christ. Look how you treat your brothers. Look how you treat your sisters. Then you want to talk to me about Christ. Yeah, does that make sense? Is it making sense? Number five is very important. The, the fifth A is accept. The consequences. Accept the consequences. Okay, so the first A was address everyone involved. The second A is avoid if, but, and maybe avoid using those words. The third A is admit specifics. And then the fourth A was acknowledge the hurt. And the fifth one is accept the consequences. Look at Luke 15 and verse 19. Luke 15 and verse 19. And this is about the story about the lost son, the son that the, the son that decided he wanted to go and, and he won all his money up front and he went and squandered it all away. And then he had a he got broke and then he had a, a, a an epiphany where he had a thought, you know, man, the, the servants at my daddy's house is doing better than I'm doing right now. So I'm going to go back home, apologize. And I tell my daddy, I'll just be a servant. And look what he says in Luke 15, verse 19. He said, and I, I am no more worthy to be called thy son. He said, make me one of thy hired servants. He was willing to do what? Accept the consequences for his decisions. And that is one of the most important things in dealing with conflict is accept the consequences for your decisions. The watch this. Y'all got to hear me because I'm connected. One of the consequences of your decision may be you need to humble yourself. You understand? And that's the problem with us. We, we say something and then say, well, they deserve it. No, no, no. You got to humble yourself and get that right. That makes sense. OK, so number six. And I know y'all ain't going to like this. A this a you're not going to like because I know you ain't going to like it, but I got to share it with you. Alter your behavior. <laughs> Alter your behavior. And that goes from Ephesians chapter 4, verses 22 through 32. Regardless of what other people do, you need to change. Does that make sense? Regardless of what other people do, you need to be like Christ. Now, let's be honest. That's hard. Right? Y'all going to leave me up here by myself? That ain't hard. Regardless of what the other person do, you got to be like what? Oh, y'all don't want to say it. I know. 
I know you don't. I remember the first time my wife and I had our argument and she wasn't doing what she was supposed to do. And I, I started, I, I start, I start acting a fool too. And the Holy Spirit said this to me. So somebody going to have to yield to the spirit. You waiting on her to do it. And I said, yeah, I'm waiting on her. She needs to apologize. And this is what God said to me. A clear as day, brother Nate. Who going to be the spiritual giant in your home? I said, I am. So I went to her and initiated the conversation. Y'all don't act looking at me like y'all know what I'm talking about. But you done been in a situation where you ain't talking to somebody and everybody's sitting there waiting on the waiting, playing the waiting game. Who going to say something first? Not me. I like I don't know what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. And it ain't just marriage, but it's other relationships. You have problems and you sit and play the waiting game. They going to call me for I call them. Right. Oh, they going to come speak to me before I speak to them again. See, you're playing a game. But when we talk about altering your behavior, it's, it's easier said than done because we always want the other person to alter their behavior. But when you trying to be like Christ, it ain't about them. It's about. And you think about it, even if you alter your behavior, there still may be consequences. When David admitted his faults with what he did with Bathsheba, he still suffered consequences. Y'all remember the consequences? The baby died. His daughter was raped by his son. So he had problems in his family. Then his other son, Absalom, refused to respect him and honor him and was trying to take the throne from him. David had all kinds of consequences, even though he told God, I'm sorry. You understand what I'm trying to say? Sin has consequences. Even if God forgives us, there's still consequences. Some of those consequences may not show up in your life, but they might show up in your kid's life. You can say what you want to say, but I know you can look at your kids and say, I don't know what's wrong with them. What's wrong with them? They acting like you. You just don't want to admit it. That's what's wrong with them. Because I and I know what I'm talking about because I'm trying to tell my kids right now. Hey, you guys can't be mean to each other. Don't be yelling at each other. Don't. And I thought about it. I said, where did they learn that from? Because I'm trying not to beat them. And instead of me beating them, I'm yelling. You understand? I'm, th I'm thinking I'm being kind. I'm being kind. I'm not whooping you. So I'm yelling. But guess what they learning? So I can sit here and try to say right, where they learning that from. No, I know where they done learned it from. And you can look at your kids and you can say whatever you want to say. They acting just like you. I'm going to keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Number seven. Ask for forgiveness and allow time. Genesis 50, go, Genesis 50 and verse 17. Ask for forgiveness and allow time. Genesis 50 and verse 17. Joseph's brother says, so shall ye say unto Joseph. After they had realized who Joseph was, remember they, they were jealous of Joseph. They tried to kill him, put him in slavery. He ended up in Egypt. He had to spend his whole lifehood or separated from his family. And then they come to find out they needed Joseph later on in life and they get before him and, and their father's about to die and look at what they said in verse 17. Let's ask Joseph to forgive us. I pray thee to trespass at our brother and our sin for they did unto thee evil and now we pray thee forgive the trespass of the servant of the God of our fathers and Joseph wept when they spake unto him. They asked Joseph please forgive us for how we were. And do you know it's, it's, it's the right thing to do to ask somebody to forgive you if you've done them wrong. Never make a confession simply to get the burden off of your shoulders or to minimize the consequences of your sin. The goal should always be to glorify God. The reason I have created this habit 
of when there's problems with me and somebody and I go to and apologize is because ultimately I want them to see Christ working in me. And hopefully if they spent any time with me and they know Sean Moore, they know I ain't scared of a fight. So I hope that they know when I come and say I'm sorry, that's Christ. Because I'm going to tell y'all right now, I wake up ready. I ain't playing. I'm ready, Reg. I wake up ready for whatever you, whatever the day bringing and whatever anybody else want to bring, I'm ready. And I'm ready for the consequences. I'm like, oh, them the consequences? Eat them. Just being honest with you. But you know that ain't Christ, right? Right or wrong? That's not going to... You can't find one scripture where Christ was just beating up people. And I ain't going to go no further than that because I ain't really into the beating up people stuff. That ain't the preacher y'all got. I'll leave that alone. Uh. <laughs> so to the original statement, the goal should be to glorify who? You understand? That's the mindset. The goal is not the, to let people see us, but to see who? Christ. Okay, so conflict resolution is only needed when there is conflict. So now I went to studying this part and I was like, Lord, you all up in my business, right? It got me studying this lesson. But I'm going to show you seven sinful ways we use our tongue that easily besets us. Seven sinful ways that we use our tongue that so easily besets us. And I know on your outline it says something else. So the number one way we use our tongue is grumbling and complaining. Grumbling and complaining. I know you don't want to hear it. Grumbling and complaining. Grumbling. Grumbling and complaining. Philippians 2 and verse 14 James 5 verse 9, but we'll look at just Philippians 2 and verse 14. James 5, 9 and Philippians 2 verse 14. Philippians 2 and verse 14 said, do all things without murmuring and disputing, murmuring and complaining. And he says, do all things. That means you should never be what? And the reason God is so adamant about that is because whenever we're complaining, we're complaining directly against God. And nobody in their right mind should ever be saying God's not good. No matter what you're going through, God is still good. And I've been listening to this song all the time. God is good. Yeah. OK. So we I've been listening to this new song by Fred Hammond. He got this song. He said him and this one pastor, they put it together. and He said what the Lord allows. Is working for you good. And I'm listening to that song. I went to Bobbin. I'm like in the car, like, what the Lord allowed. And I said, okay, God, you, it's true. The, the words is so true. Whatever God allowed in your life, He's working it out for your good. And regardless of what God is allowing in your life, He is still good. Even if He allowed you to die, He's still good. He's bringing you home. You're going to get your new body. You're going to get to see what heaven looks like. So even if he don't let you stay here on this earth, we shouldn't be trying to stay here forever anyway, because the Bible tells us we're not. So eventually we know we got to work. But even if the doctor say, man, you got two weeks, we still should be saying, yes, God is good. You know why? And the doctor should say, what are you talking about? Well, I don't necessarily want to die, but I knew it was coming. And since it's coming, I might as well recognize that now I'm getting ready to go to heaven. And because of that, God is good. Okay, no grumbling and complaining. Number two, falsehood. Falsehood. Any deception or twisting of the truth. Proverbs 24, 28, and Exodus 20, 16. Let's look at Exodus 20 and verse 16. 
falsehood, any deception or, or twisting of the truth. Exodus 20, verse 16 says, Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. That means you ought to speak what? Truth. Look at Proverbs 24. Proverbs 24 and verse 28. It said, Be not a witness against thy neighbor without cause and deceive not with thy lips. So we need to stay away from any falsehood. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. When my wife and I is about to get hot, we walk two miles every evening together, try to spend time with them, winding down my day. I try to, that's my way of spending some time with my family, my kids. We take a two mile walk. And I tell my wife, I said, look, don't be looking around because then you got to admit that you saw something. Quit looking around. Neighbor's garage up. She looking. What you're looking for? Because I can't tell no lie. If they say that you see something, guess what we got to do? You got to tell the truth. But if you didn't see nothing, you ain't got to say nothing. Quit looking around. Just focus on. You understand what I'm saying? But if you see something, guess what you got to do? I'm trying to help y'all right now, man. If you see something, you got to tell the truth. You can't be lying. If you keep your eyes straight ahead, you ain't got to lie. Okay, okay. Number three. Gossip. Gossip. Revealing or discussing personal information about others with people who are not part of the problem or solution. Now, this one I had to sit on down and confess. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm guilty of talking to people about things that ain't their business. Amen. They ain't a part of the solution. Proverbs 16 and verse 28. Proverbs 20 and verse 19. Proverbs 26. And verse 20, Proverbs 11 and verse 13, just in case you're writing it down. Proverbs 16, 28, Proverbs 20, verse 19, Proverbs 26, 20, Proverbs 11, 13. I'm going to look at Proverbs 16, 28. It says, a forward man soweth strife and a whisperer separate his chief friends. Now, what that means is that say I got a problem with Walter Johnson. And I go tell Mitch, man, Walter be working my last nerve, man. And now Mitch, my friend, Mitch, my close friend, Mitch said, you know what? He worked mine too. I said, man, I ain't talking to him for a while. Mitch said, I ain't talking to him either. <laughs> now Mitch was just talking to Walter for until I went over there and what? And now Walter trying to talk to Mitch and guess what? Mitch like, nah, man, you dissing my boy. You see how that worked? Now, if I wouldn't have never said nothing to Mitch, it wouldn't have affected their relationship. But now what? Their relationship is affected because I. And that's why I try to be careful. I don't talk to my wife about stuff. When 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 Sister Daniel is mean to me and being being. <laughs> I don't tell my wife because I don't want my wife to be looking at Sister Daniel. What? You understand? Now, Sister Daniel says she apologized since then. So all y'all know our relationship is good now. But before. I didn't tell my wife what she was doing. You understand? Because I know how my wife is. My wife got my back. Sometimes. For the most part. Look at Proverbs 11 and verse 13. Yeah, you right, Red. Sometimes. I'll be watching her. I'll be asking her, what jersey you got on? You know what I'm saying? You ain't got the same jersey on. Proverbs 11 and verse 13 says, a talebearer revealed his secrets. But that but he that is of a faithful spirit conceals the matter. Sometimes we need to be those people that we can keep some things what? To ourselves. That's important. Do you know that I done had some problems with some people in the church and, and I ain't never said nothing about it? You should be able to say the same thing, right? Right? Okay, so gossip. Number four, slander, slander, speaking false and malicious words, slander. We don't want to slander anyone. That makes sense. Look at Second Timothy three. 
2 Timothy 3, 3, Titus 2, 3, 2 Timothy 3, 3 says, without natural affection, truth breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, but the false accusers, slanders, slanderer, slandering somebody. Okay, number five, harsh or reckless or worthless words. Harsh. Harsh. When you speak to people, you don't have to be what? So rough all the time. I know I'm working on it. Especially with my wife and my kids. I'm working on it. Look at Proverbs 15 and verse 1. Proverbs 15, verse 1. Once y'all get there, most of y'all know this verse, right? Proverbs 15, 1. Once you get there, we know the verse, right? What does it say? A soft answer, but grievous words. Has somebody ever been, been, their voice was high and you talk low and all of a sudden everything was calmed down? But has somebody ever raised their voice and you raised yours, what happened? It just escalates. But when you start using that soft voice, because see, I've been working on it. See that soft voice? Why are you upset, man? Why are you yelling? Why are we? Hey, hey, it's OK, brother. We ain't yelling at each other. You see how I've been working on that street? Now, I don't always exercise. It. <laughs> I'm trying to get 100 percent at it, but it ain't always like that. But a soft answer turns the way wrath. Our tone affects our situation. Look at Ephesians 4 and verse 29. Ephesians 4 and verse 29. The Bible says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Let no corrupt communication. Now you see the word no? Y'all know what no means? That means none. None at all. Can anybody say that they, they are 100 percent there? OK, number six, not keeping your word. Now, I have to be honest with you. This one is one of my pet peeves, not keeping your word. We we as Christ followers should be men and women of our word. Does that makes sense. Like I said Sunday, if, if you're not a person that keeps your word, don't be telling people you follow Christ. Because people expect you to keep your word. If you tell somebody you're going to do something, you need to put it in your phone. You need to do something. You need to tell you. You need to figure it out because we can't be forgetting stuff. And I'm at the age right now where everything's in my phone. Because I won't remember. Well, I'll just tell you, I, I, I'm supposed to go see Sister Kaysen after Bible study. Guess what popped up at 11 o'clock on my phone? Sister Kaysen. You know why? Because I wouldn't have remembered. If, but I told her I was going to do something. I cannot do that. You understand? So I put it in my phone to remind me because I would forget. What I'm saying to you is that as a man or a woman of God, a Christ follower, you got to keep your word. Look at Psalms 15 and verse 1. Psalm 15 and verse 1. I think I got the wrong verse. Go to Matthew 5 and verse 37. See, that's what happens when you get old. Go to Matthew 5 and verse 37. That's the one I want. Matthew 5, verse 37. I don't even know why I put that song there. Matthew 5 and verse 37 says, But let your communication be yay, yay, and nay, nay. For whatsoever is more than these cometh of evil. Let your yes be yes, and let your no be no. If you can't do something, tell people the truth. Don't be a people pleaser. Trying to say you can do everything and then you don't do it. 
It's okay to tell people what? No, I can't do it. You only got 24 hours in a day. Now, if you got a job, that's not what I'm talking about. You can't go tell your boss no. That makes sense. Because some of y'all are going to get fired talking about somebody. I, with my, I went and told my boss I can't do that. No, that's not what I was saying. I'm talking about outside of work, we need to make sure we manage our time. If you can do something, you can. If you can't, you can't. But you need to be a man or a woman of your what? Number seven, not respecting authority. Okay, let me go back to the top. Several sinful ways we use our tongues. Not respecting authority. This is, I need y'all to hear what I'm about to say, and this is probably so important. If you cannot respect the person, learn to respect the position. Because God's not going to hold you accountable for the person, but he's going to hold you accountable for your respect. Does that make sense? You can't say because you don't like a certain person that you're not going to respect them when they have a position of authority. You're supposed to, I'm supposed to respect the position, even if I can't respect the person. That makes sense. And I know y'all know where I'm about to go with this. When you have a president that you don't like, guess what you're supposed to do? Respect the position. If you can't respect the person and I'm telling you as a mature Christian or a mature Christ follower, you better learn how to do that because God is going to hold us accountable. There are certain scriptures that tell us what we're supposed to be doing for those who are in authority. Y'all know one of them. What are we to do? Pray for them. Pray for them. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And not just pray for them, honor them. Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. We don't have time to look at all these, but y'all write it down. Go back and look at it for yourself. Romans 13, verses 1 through 7. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 18. And 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. We're supposed to honor those that are in authority, and we're supposed to pray for those that are in authority. That's what we're supposed to do. And obey them. Oh, don't go there, Walter, because that that ain't that that's that's concerning the church. Oh, OK, that's concerning the past. Oh, OK, I'm just wondering if you knew. <laughs> no, I'm just saying people have said I've heard people say it all the time. Well, the pastor, just a man like me, put his pants on like me. But hey, that, that sounds good. Yes, he does. But scripture says we ought to submit to the authority of those that have the rule over us. That's not that's not man made. That's scripture. And how many times people we don't heard of churches splitting because people don't bucked up against authority. That ain't that's not a fairy tale that happens. Too often. Romans 13, 1 through 7, 1 Peter 2, 13 through 18, and 1 Timothy 2, 1 through 2. 1 Peter 2, 13 through 18. Okay, so I'm going to ask you a few thought-provoking questions and I'm done. Can you recall a recent situation where you realized you were in the wrong? How did you come to that realization and what did you do about it? Because that's important. You should be... And if, and if you sit there and say you ain't never wrong, something ain't right. Something ain't right. And I know Reggie Smith said, man, he's scratching his head like I, it's been 20 years. No, Reg, ain't been 20. <laughs> it said recent. Can you recall a recent situation? Reg said it's been 20 years. No. Have you ever struggled with admitting fault? If so, what helped you to overcome that challenge? Can I be honest with you? I struggled with that. Because I did, I do. Why I got to be the one to admit that I'm wrong? Question number three. In what ways do you believe acknowledging wrongdoings contribute to personal growth? 
That's one of the hardest things to do is say, I'm sorry or I was wrong. It's so hard. You know why? Because pride says, I ain't doing that. Right? Number four, how does the inability to control one's tongue contribute to conflict and misunderstanding? I know you like me. Yeah, you ever just looked and said, boy, I wish I could just be quiet. I done got victory over a lot of sins, but that one right there, I'd be like, Lord, okay, you, I see what you're doing. You're going you're gonna to constantly have me where I got to ask for forgiveness. We need to be more like Christ. And I'm going to give you one more scripture and I'm done. First Peter 2 and look at verse. Uh, well, yeah, first Peter 2, look at verse 18. And I'm done. We need to be more like Christ. This is what Peter said. Peter says, servants, be subject to your masters with all fear. This is this is one of my favorite verses that I used when I had a job. Y'all see what it says? Servants, be subject to your master with all fear, not only to the what? Good and gentle, but also to the what? So that that's why every job I've had, they had the best associate in the world because of this verse. No matter how my boss talked to me, guess what I did? What they told me to do because of this verse. Verse 19 said, for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your faults, ye should take it patiently. But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Watch verse 21 says, for even hereunto were ye called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his footstep. And verse 22 says, Christ did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth at all. But look at what verse 23 said. Who, when he was reviled, he reviled not again. And when he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judges righteously. One of the hardest things in the world is to put the situation in God's hand. But that is exactly what we need to learn how to do. Amen. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. And Lord, we thank you for your word. Help us, Father God, to continue to go back over these tools and use these tools when we're dealing with conflict. Ultimately, Father God, we want to live a life that glorifies you. And the only way we can do that is for us to be more like Christ. Help us to handle conflict the way Christ will handle it. In Jesus name, I pray. Amen. Amen.